Marshall says, Elon being asked by government to help with chip shortages. Only if first Biden says Tesla and SpaceX is leading an EV in space, never will happen. I don't think that the Biden administration actually said they were going to ask Elon for help with chip shortages. I don't, I don't think that's what actually happened. I think people are overstating that communication. And the spokesperson who was speaking, I don't believe she ever mentioned Elon's name or Tesla's name either. So that's going on. Um, there, I'm going to be talking about the interactions between Elon and the White House and Tesla and the White House later in this video. So let's just get started. And by the way, I'm wearing the Starship t-shirt. The big news this week is going to be Starship. Uh, you can get the Starship t-shirt at elonbits.com. I'll tell you more about it when we get to that part of it. I'm going to talk about Tesla first. Dave Lee had this tweet. Was, he was talking about why he thinks Elon made that step towards focusing on Tesla bot. And I, I didn't take Elon's comments about Tesla bot from the earnings call to be that significant, but Dave Lee did. So he, su he suggested that maybe Elon was showing a better than expected early prototype, which I think is unlikely. I don't think they have a full prototype of bot yet. That's my gut hunch that, that that's not happened yet. But he said it made it obvious to him that Tesla needs to double down on this. I don't think that Elon's view on bot is driven by a prototype. Elon's view on bot is driven by the success or the, the, the rapid pace of improvement that the Tesla autopilot team is seeing with FSD and FSD beta. So Elon responds to this by saying, I'm driving this program personally, as is the case for almost all new programs. And that led to an interesting back and forth between Elon and Dave Lee. Dave thought of some questions he'd like to ask Elon about his insistence to drive almost all new programs. And Elon says, I know you're a fan, but this is a silly question. I don't drive programs because I want to. I drive programs because I have to. I think I made a video about this already, but I just think the point here is that the way Tesla is set up, they have a team and the team is doing what they have to do. And I don't think anybody is available to have the, the, the vision that Elon has. Drew is working on what he's working on. The autopilot team, you know, uh, Karpathy and Ashok, they're working on what they're working on. Ganesh, Zach Kirkhorn is working on the financial side of the business. There's nobody high ranking at Tesla who's free to say, let's dive deep into the engineering. And, and because Elon is the, the top shareholder, because Elon is the visionary behind the company, he can come in and lead certain programs. Like he doesn't need to lead 4680 right now, right? 4680, I think Drew Baglino's got, got a hold of 4680. Uh, there's teams building out the factories. I think Elon's involved in all that stuff, but... But there's other people who are really focused on certain aspects of the company. And, you know, increasing Model 3, Model Y production in Shanghai, Elon is probably not spearheading that. There's somebody in China who's making sure that that's working. There's certain things that really need Elon's hand, Elon's mind, Elon's attention. And so those are the things that he has to dive into. And he can't run everything. So, sorry, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm recovering from COVID. I'm recovering well from COVID. Slight headache and maybe a little dehydrated. I'm not sure why, but we'll see. That was really uh, an interesting exchange. Number one, that Elon had this fairly lively exchange with Dave Lee, direct, you know, back and forth. And the, the way he spoke to Dave, you know, I know there's a fan, this is a silly question. And does he mean he, lead, he drives programs because he has to because no one else will or because he has to because he feels compelled to because it's the nature of his personality? I think it, he feels that no one else can drive certain programs, that he has to be the one driving them. And I think it's a largely because he is the CEO, he is the top shareholder, he's the visionary behind the company. And it leads to this question, and I did, that was the video I made this week, uh, earlier this week, is what if, you know, the Elon risk, what happens to Tesla if Elon's not there? And, you know, does he think, hi, hi Alexander, does he think that the company would fall apart without him driving certain programs? And I, I think he knows better, it would be interesting to see like what succession planning does Tesla have in place? This is a criticism that people have had, you know, what's the succession plan? And I, I think that there's a really solid team at Tesla that, you know, I think Drew Baglino understands a lot of the engineering of the company. I think Karpathy and Ashok and Ganesh, they really understand what the autopilot team is trying to accomplish. Um, 
but it is sort of an interesting question what happens without elon and you know what program i think you know program like tesla bot might be really hard to move forward without elon although i think that carpathy seems to get that one so carpathy was talking about that one adam says early stage projects don't have clear engineering pros and cons on decisions they have to be driven by gut decisions with somebody having a strong vision and a big pull in the company nobody better than elon exactly adam thank you Dave to Dave says, I think Carpathy would take over Tesla if Elon was gone. I think it would be Baglino, but I think the key point is that there's a great team of players out at, at Tesla. There's a lot of strong people. And I, I think his Baglino is number, you know, when you look at the listing of who are the top players at Tesla, it's Elon, Zach Kirkhorn, and Drew Baglino. Kirkhorn is not an engineer. He's a, a financial type. So my gut hunch is that he would not be the one to run the company. It would have to be Baglino because it has to be run by engineers. So that's my take on it. On the other hand, Kirkhorn definitely appreciates the engineering engineering side of the company. So maybe he would be the one. I don't know. I would think it'd be Baglino. Okay. So let me move on. Uh, other interesting news here. Gail from Austin commented that uh, Tesla deployed 81 megapacks uh, to now avail now available to support the Tesla grid during outages back in February of last year. There was a a real cold spell and it knocked out the grid. And Elon said, "As Tesla is working hard to provide more megapacks for grid stabilization, so I think we're looking for more megapacks to come, um, not just in Texas but all over the world. Megapack factory coming online, God knows when soon. I hope and." Uh, and we'll start hopefully seeing the ramping of Megapack, which is obviously good for society. It's good for the grid. It's good for uh, the people. Also really good for Tesla shareholders because <clears throat> once Megapack scales, it's a lot of revenue. And once they're using lithium iron phosphate and they produce at scale, it should be high margin. It should be 50% margin. I think the revenue per kilowatt hour or per gigawatt hour whatever is higher with cars than it is with megapack but megapack is still important and it's still highly profitable there's been a couple of quote recalls referenced in the media and it's dumb uh it's not a recall when a recall gives you the impression you have to bring your car in and get something fixed and a recall being we're we're doing an over-the-air update of your car so while your car sit in the garage at night and you don't even know it's happening your car software is being updated Calling that a recall is kind of confusing. And Elon noted that the terminology is anachronistic. It's, a, it's an old term that doesn't really fit what they're doing. Now, I have a recall on my Model 3 for the rear cameras, something about the cables. I haven't bothered to bring it in. Maybe I should. I don't know. But I haven't noticed a significant problem with the rear cameras. That's an actual recall. But And, you know, supposedly it affects 500,000 cars. But I have one of them. I haven't brought it in yet. It only matters if a lot of the cars come in and they don't, they aren't. So not a big deal. Um, this is the big part. This is what I think is really exciting. Uh, those who follow me long enough, you know, I'm actually more excited about Starship and SpaceX than I am about Tesla. I'm excited about Tesla and I own stock in Tesla and I don't own stock in SpaceX. So from a personal financial standpoint, I'm more interested in Tesla. But from uh, what gets me excited about the world and the future, Starship is big there. So in conversations about Falcon, let me just, uh, this, I think this was in response to Eric Berger talking about Falcon 9 rocket has now flown more consecutive successful missions, 111 than any orbital rocket in history. That's great stuff. So Elon was responding to that. And uh, somebody was asking, Elon was saying it's, you know, a lot of the payload to orbit, mass to orbit is coming from, star, from Falcon 9. And somebody asked him about Starship and Elon said, Starship's in a different league said a lot of the stuff we've seen him say before. And then Serene asks him, when's the Starship presentation happening, Elon Musk? And Elon says, Thursday next week at 8 p.m. What? So apparently there's a Starship presentation on this coming Thursday. It's like the 10th. And I'm disappointed because I'm not going to be able to make it because I don't think I should hop on a plane uh, having just had COVID. I mean, maybe I'll test negative for COVID before then, but I, I don't plan on testing myself until the morning, maybe, or the morning before. And I don't think it would make sense for me to fly on a plane. I don't have an invite to the event, so it'd be kind of aggressive for me to show up and have some personal things going on here in Florida I got to take care of. So, but I will be glued to YouTube at eight o'clock Thursday. 
Texas time, nine o'clock here. I will be glued to the screen. I will be recording it. I am expecting to make a video about this. Um, one of the things that I think is fast, and, and if you check NASA's spaceflight channel on YouTube, I believe they just mounted super heavy booster on the launch tower. I believe they're going to be putting Starship on the launch tower, on uh, stacking it next. So it's going to be full stack ready for the presentation. One of the interesting things that's going on, Elon tweeted on the second, but referring back to his old tweets from February of 2019, talking about the, what they're trying to achieve with Raptor. Um, and you go back there and they were trying to achieve 300 bars of main chamber pressure. And Elon is now saying 320 bars, maybe even 330. They're constantly working on improving. The, what's going on with the rocket is interesting. With the with the engine, with the Raptor 2 engine is interesting. And I'm hoping we're going to hear, hear more about the Raptor 2 engine uh, at this presentation. And then I don't have it. There was a tweet a while back where Elon said that the the future rocket engine there, there, there. I believe SpaceX has some other rocket engine under development to replace Raptor 2 at some point. And I would love to see more information about that. I'm hoping that he gets a question about that at the Starship presentation. If I were able to go, that's the question I would ask. If I had my, if I had my one question for Elon, people always say, if you have one question for Elon, right now, that'd be my one question. But what's the next engine after Raptor 2? This is pretty exciting news. Starlink announced a high-performance antenna. The high-performance antenna, high-performance antenna is twice the area of the standard phased array with a broader scan angle. This antenna, the high-performance antenna, is going to enable much higher bandwidth. <laughs> this is not necessary for the typical residential customer. This might be necessary for somebody who's running a business that is somewhere that doesn't have other regular good internet access. You know, maybe on a cruise ship. Um, some kinds of operations that are just outside the scope of where fiber is run. That could make a lot of sense. And then Elon also said that standard an antenna production rises rapidly this year, so those with orders shouldn't have to wait too long. Shouldn't have to wait long. Starlink can only support a limited number of users in an area, so best order early. I, by the way, did order Starlink recently. Um, I'm expecting to uh, buy a piece of land north of Palm Beach, north of West Palm Beach, and probably be off grid and be able to, I mean, I could just go to my off grid piece of land I have now, but that's kind of in the middle of nowhere. I think we want to be closer to certain family members. So I think in 2023, we're going to be buying a piece of land that's closer and hopefully have Starling for that and maybe go on an RV trip and have Starling for that RV trip too. So <clears throat> let me get Elon's schedule right, please. Starship on Thursday the 10th and trip to Berlin for mid-month. I did not hear about a Berlin trip. Um, so we covered Starlink. I'm excited about that. I, I, I haven't heard. I think my Starlink should be arriving in the midsummer. We'll see how that goes. Now, uh, Omar, Omar's catalog tweaked Elon or about Lucid Air. It's striking that Lucid was delivered without certain key software. I believe they are now rolling out that software to the people who have already taken their Lucids and the new Lucids coming, being delivered, have the software in place. They don't, I think. Last I read, adaptive cruise control still isn't working. They're still waiting. The adaptive cruise control is when you're driving down the road and you're following another car and adjusts it to speed based on the vehicle in front of you. I thought I saw that adaptive cruise control wasn't working yet. So Elon commented that Tesla has great respect for soft en software engineering. They do not. And then Tesla is as much a hardware software company as a hardware company, both in car and in factory. This is not widely understood. So number one, a lot of people did not like Elon taking this shot. A lot of Lucid fans did not like Elon taking a shot at Lucid for not having great respect for software engineering. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, my hunch is that Elon knows a lot about what's going on inside Lucid because a lot of former Tesla employees are in, employees are in Lucid and somebody may be talking to him. Um, or maybe he just has a hunch or maybe he knows more for what, Elon has a lot of sources, I'm pretty sure, for for a lot of information. So, the other part that I think is really key here is his language. Tesla's as much a software company as is a hardware company, both in car and in a factory. This is not widely understood. So as Tesla owners, we're familiar with the software in the car. 
in the factory there there's so they use software in a lot of different ways in the factory that helps make them a more effective company and it's things like their basically the operating system for the factory the way the factory operates is based on in-house software and i think it's really something that is underappreciated at tesla and elon says that and it's hard for me to appreciate it because i've never run a factory i don't know what that means now let's get to politics a little bit so politics and media gail questions the motives of mainstream media have a track record of spreading fud against tesla this guy tom krischer who's an associated press reporter wanted to talk to gail uh gail says if tom wants a convo can be public that's why i like twitter what's your question and tom said please send me an email he's resistant to asking his question openly in public and elon responds they've been writing bodegas articles about tesla and me for years in the end it's their own credibility that suffers a lot of reporters you know blue check marks rush to defend tom krischer and i i found it i don't i can't find it now but i found a tweet of tom krischer's where he was you know predicting that tesla was going to fail basically um, and he obviously got it completely wrong. So, you know, he's just an, one of a long string of reporters who consistently attacks Tesla. The number of media su media who support Tesla, who are fair to Tesla, are pretty rare. One of them's coming up in a second. Then the most popular political thing going on is that Elon's been trying to get Biden, or not Elon, a lot of us are upset. I mean, I just sort of accept that Biden's an idiot and the administration's a bunch of idiots, but that the president, of the United, that the, the Biden administration refuses to use the word Tesla and refuses to mention Elon Musk by name. And I don't think they talk about SpaceX either. It's pretty striking that SpaceX is launching payloads for the military, launching payloads for the uh, National Security Council or whatever, the, the NRO mission. National, they're, they're, they're launching missions for the U.S. government. And uh, the, Fed, the administration won't mention Elon, Tesla, or SpaceX. So there's a petition out there to get the president to say the word Tesla and acknowledge what Tesla is doing. And uh, it's not making a lot of progress. So anyway, there's this interview. Sarah Eisen, if you haven't seen this, um, he's Sarah Eisen from CNBC asks, uh, I think he's a National Economic Council or something like that, advisor. He asked him why Elon Musk wasn't invited to the week's White House meeting with CEOs about Build Back Better. <clears throat> it was talking about EVs. And the guy goes, it's like two minutes long, the guy just rambles on and on, careful to avoid mentioning Tesla, careful to avoid mentioning Elon Musk, careful to avoid saying anything positive about the company. Um, talking about how they're working with partners who, you know, he, he talked, it was like, it's like a word salad. It's really striking how much, uh, how difficult it has been to get them to acknowledge what Tesla is doing for the EV movement. And it really just exposes that the Biden administration does not really care about electric vehicles. They don't really care about the environment. They care about political power. And then unrelated to the Biden administration about politics in Canada, there's this big protest going on in Ottawa and maybe elsewhere in Canada. And uh, Elon has been chipping in quite a bit. Don't People are like, why is Elon chipping on? Don't forget, Elon is, I believe, also a Canadian citizen. I think he's a South African, Canadian, and American citizen. Um, maybe he's just a Canadian and American citizen. I'm not sure. But he is a, he you know lived in Canada. He's got experience in Canada. He's got friends in Canada. So he has reasons for being interested in Canada. But he said it would appear that the so-called fringe minority is actually the government. If the government had the mandate of the people, there would be a significant counter-protest. There is not, and therefore they do not. Um, for whatever reason, um, Canada's government continues to be very difficult with this you know, lockdown situation, and I don't understand it. People who know me know. I. Sarah says, I doubt Elon gives two figs about what the Biden administration thinks. I think he probably would appreciate it if... if the Biden administration recognized Tesla's efforts, and he probably is at least a little miffed that the Biden administration is so uh, pretends that Tesla doesn't exist. And you know, look, the the federal government uh, leadership of the federal government is coordinating with Tesla's competitors. They have no competition. Yeah, Biden's unlikely to be related. Well, we'll see what happens in 2022. I'm terrible at making political predictions. I'm often wrong. My gut hunch is that the Republicans are going to have a landslide win in the midterm election. And there's a lot of signs of that. 
And there's a lot of signs of that. Um, Democratic members of the House deciding not to run free election because they figure they're going to lose. <clears throat> so, Adam says it may be useful to get Elon's input on policy decisions, but they would probably ignore him even if he was invited. They don't care about policy. They care about power. Uh, Sarah says he just wants the contracts and the money. That's what counts. Tesla doesn't need federal money or federal contracts. I mean, SpaceX needs federal contracts, but NASA needs NASA and the U.S. military need SpaceX more than SpaceX needs NASA and the U.S. military at this point. Um, Na- SpaceX is able to deliver launches, <coughs> reliably deliver the launches that they want to get done, and nobody else can do it in the way they can do it. So I think they just did a launch on a SpaceX rocket. Some, some Europe, uh, it, Italy just did a launch on a SpaceX rocket because they were supposed to use a European rocket and there was no European rocket available. Got some Q&A. Jim asks, does anyone know what violations the short sellers of Tesla are being investigated for? Has the Securities and Exchange Commission, aka the Short Seller Enrichment Commission, finally woken up years later? I have not heard anything about short sellers of Tesla being investigated. I think it's unlikely that the SEC will investigate short sellers, uh, but... I don't know if anybody else has heard anything on that. I have not heard anything about that, Jim. I appreciate the question. I wish I had an answer for you. I don't. <laughs> George Strickland had a question that I feel more confident answering. If the battery in a Model 3 is half the cost of the vehicle, body and hardware is the other half the cost, then would you assume that Optimus Subprime, that's Tesla bot, will have the same hardware and software should cost less $10,000 fully ramped, or what's your numbers say? So... I don't think the battery in a Model 3 is quite half the cost of the vehicle. Um, It's not half the price of the vehicle, that's for sure. So if you figure it's an 80 kilowatt hour pack and you figure it's $100 a kilowatt hour, which is a good ballpark estimate of the cost of the battery, that's the battery cells, that would be $8,000. I think it probably costs Tesla more than $20,000 to manufacture a Model 3, probably more like $25,000. So even with the battery pack being $10,000, that wouldn't be half the cost of the vehicle. So just addressing that side of it, I think it's probably less than half the cost of the vehicle. And if you're talking about like an LFP uh, standard range Tesla, then those batteries cost significantly less still. So, I mean, it's, it's a big chunk of the cost of the, ve- of the vehicle. So with Optimus Subprime, though, my, my approach to, or the Tesla bot, my approach is to think about Model 3 and say, let's say a Model 3 is a $40,000 vehicle, $40,000 vehicle, probably cost them $30,000 to make it, $25,000 to make it. The bot, the, the Model 3 weighs about 4,000 pounds, 3,500, 4,000 pounds. The bot weighs 125 pounds. So the bot weighs one thirtieth of the mass of a Model 3. So on a raw materials cost basis, the bot should be you know, way less than one-tenth the cost of a Model 3. Now there's more parts and there's you know, some other issues, more uh, moving parts maybe per, per mass. But my, I would be surprised if it was more than $10,000. I actually think it's gonna end up costing about $5,000 a bot to make them. Once they're making them, when they're making millions a year, fully ramped, I would expect that it's gonna cost them $5,000 or so to make a bot. And the value that the bot generates is so insanely off the charts that it really doesn't matter if it's five or ten thousand dollars. If the bot generates a million dollars in value, because it's able to work, let's say two shifts, ten dollars an hour. When you add it up, the ultimate value generated by the bot is hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million dollars or more. Oh, P. Burns his thoughts on FUD FSD videos and fairness. Let me let me address that question before I go to the Patreon questions. So uh, for those who are following it, there's a guy named Taylor Ogan. I've interviewed Taylor Ogan before on my YouTube channel. You can check out that video on my YouTube channel. Taylor Ogan worked with the Boston Globe and put together a series of clips of FSD supposedly behaving badly in South Boston. Uh, I found it suspicious because it was like a highlight reel or a low light reel. I was like, well, where's the whole video? Right? You know, and he said, well, it was just clips that that... Uh, the people that were riding in the car with him took. Like, well, well, where's the hot... How did they know to turn the camera on right before the bad moment? Right? And look, I, I'm the first person to tell you that FSD makes mistakes. It's not perfect. And they, uh, he was interviewed by uh, Fred from Electrek. And it was absolutely horrible interview. Like, I was joking that 
Taylor needed a couple of rolls of toilet paper to wipe his ass from all the the ass kissing that that Fred did when he when he was talking to him. Just, he just like there's no critical questions. No, it's really frustrating when people don't ask critical questions. You know, just ask fawning questions. What are you doing? What's the point? How are we learning from that? Ask hard questions and see how people respond to hard questions. So, Fred, you're a loser. I mean, ask hard questions. Come on. If you're going to be interviewing people, don't just give them softball questions. Ask them hard questions and see how they come up with the answers. That's the real challenge. That's how we really learn. If you're just going to ask them to say the same thing he's already said, then you don't learn anything from them. So, I think it's possible that either... They had a really, really good ride, and there were a few bad moments, and they excerpted just for the, you know, they had the whole video, and they only showed a couple bad moments. Another possibility is that you can put FSD in a bad situation. You can drive the car into a bad situation and then engage FSD when you know it's in a bad situation, and it's more likely to make a mistake. And you can say, okay, turn your camera on now. I'm going to make it mess up. Um, I don't know what happened, but I know that Taylor has a history of um, sabotaging Tesla. I mean, he's not effective at it, but he's trying to sand uh, to attack Tesla. So that's my gut there. The reality is, if you watch FSD videos, if you watch Chuck Cook's videos, if you watch Kim Paquette's videos, you watch my—I have a video not that long ago. People who are doing FSD beta videos are showing the flaws. We're not hiding them. Um, I, I, so I think that's odd. I, I just think it's odd. No, and no one is claiming that FSD is ready to be a robo taxi today. It's learning, it's learning fast, and it's learning in ways that are not necessarily obvious to the eye. Matrizar says, a huge application for the bot is in final mile delivery. Once the self-driving vehicle arrives, how does the package get from the vehicle to the door? Subprime is the answer. That might be an answer. There's another theory, which is you don't bother with the car. You just have Tesla bot riding a roller skates or something, or a, a skateboard or something, and scooter. A much less expensive vehicle than, than a Tesla vehicle. And he gets there maybe a little slower, but you know the cost of moving a, a small scooter and a bot is a lot less than the cost of moving a full-size car. So that may be a more efficient way of doing it than what you suggest. I'm not sure that last mile is the best use of it. Adam says, Holmar's catalog and some others make raw 1x FSD videos. Those are better for statistics, but we'll never see as accurately as Tesla. Yeah, see, Tesla is seeing data that we can't see. They're, they're seeing numbers we can't see because they're looking at the whole fleet. So one person drives FSD and has a good experience or a bad experience. That doesn't tell you a lot. What you're really looking for is large-scale numbers. Scooters don't carry hundreds of packages. Well, you're not going to deliver hundreds of packages anyway. Um, but, you know, I think hundreds of packages would be optimistic. So. All right, last, the Patreon Q&A. And I just want to be clear, uh, if you support this channel on Locals, on Patreon, or on YouTube, chat as a YouTube channel member, you get the opportunity to ask questions that will be addressed in the live stream. So that's why I did the Locals Q&A, the, the YouTube Q&A, and now the Patreon Q&A. So thanks to all those people for their support. Um, Greg says, do I think Tesla will be able to lower prices in the future considering the increasing demand for Tesla vehicles is so high? There's likely to be a shortage of batteries for all other EVs in the near future. I think that prices are high right now, and I think that once the chip shortage fades, I think there's going to be enough batteries, particularly lithium iron phosphate batteries, that low-end Model 3s with lithium iron phosphate will probably be reasonably priced. Um, and then going further down, I think the question is, how long will there be a shortage of batteries? I think you're going to get out to 2024. And I think the battery shortage is going to be mostly resolved. And then I think that we will see a decline in prices of Tesla vehicles, except if FSD is working and the robo taxi network is live, then the price they then they won't sell a vehicle without FSD. I think this is going to Ken's question down here too. Um, once they have working FSD that's capable of robo taxi it would not make sense to sell a car without full FSD because someone will pay for full FSD. So anybody who's buying it without FSD, that's a vehicle that you've produced that you didn't sell for the full price you can get for it. So yeah, I don't, I think the battery shortage will be, there will be some of a, somewhat of a battery shortage in 2023, but not that bad. I think 4680 is going to scale production before the end of 2022. 
and there'll be a lot of 20, uh, 4680 cells. And there's going to be a lot of lithium iron phosphate cells. But Tesla did say, I don't remember if it was Zach or Elon said, that they're expecting to be battery constrained in 2023. So there's still going to be some shortage of batteries. But I think that shortage of batteries is going to be a lot less than before. I think there's a question of when Panasonic's 4680 cells become available. I think LG Chem might be working on 4680 cells. So there may be a lot of 4680 cells available. So AK says, even though HD mapping doesn't scale, do you think competitions, robo-taxis can still make a business in dense, high-traffic population centers? No. No, I, I don't think... It's not about HD mapping. I think the fundamental... There's a lot of different hurdles for other companies to get self-driving cars. Um, the first hurdle is HD mapping doesn't solve a pedestrian stepping in the road in front of your car. So they have to be able to identify objects. This is why Tesla vision system is so important. You have to be able to identify objects and predict what they're going to do. And the way that you get there is with massive amounts of data, um, training the system on the way people behave and the way objects behave. And HD mapping doesn't give you any of that. And then the second problem is that the cost of producing, let's say a Waymo, right? The cost of producing a Waymo vehicle ends up being around $200,000, maybe more. When you amortize that over, let's say, a 100,000 mile life of the vehicle, then you're talking about $2 a mile just for amortizing the vehicle. So the price of a ride in order to be profitable has to be probably more than $3 a mile, maybe $4 a mile. And Ubers right now are like $2.50 a mile. So the thing that Tesla's got down is because once they get it working, the cost of providing a ride per mile can get as low as 25 cents a mile. They can arbitrarily price it wherever they need to price it, not arbitrarily. When, they, when it's early and they don't have enough robo-taxis, it'll be priced higher because there won't be enough robo-taxis to handle the demand. But once they scale production of robo-taxis, then ultimately the price of a robo-taxi ride on Tesla will be get down around 25 cents. Waymo is not going to be able to do a ride for less than $2 and maybe 3 or $4 a mile. So it's not really competitive. So I wouldn't say that's competition. Ken Switzer says, with the announcement that they were not working on the battery day card, do you think they will, that means they will switch to primarily making robo-taxis and not selling to computer consumers? Um, I don't think that's what that meant. Um, I do think that they will ultimately, I have said that for a while, that ultimately they will switch to primarily making robo-taxis and not selling to consumers. They'll sell to consumers, but the price will be so high that only a few consumers will be able to buy it. And if you want to buy an EV to drive, then, then buy a Mach-E or get a Tesla, get your Tesla now. If that's what you want, get your Tesla now, get it before they stop selling them. So I think the announcement they were not working on the battery day car was just a reference to the fact that the demand for Model Y and Model 3 are off the charts and... You know, you can sell a $50,000. <laughs> Each car has the same number of chips, right? Roughly. The chips don't differ. The $50,000 car has the same chips as the $25,000 car. So you've got a limited number of chips. Are you going to sell $50,000 cars with them or $25,000 cars with them? It, it, it only makes sense from a business standpoint to continue selling the high-end cars as long as you don't have trouble selling them. You only sell a lower end car when you can't sell the high end cars. With HT mapping, you either need to solve vision anyway, yes, or update maps daily. Not even daily, daily isn't enough for updating the maps. You gotta update them more than that. Google is trying to keep way more accidents. That's private for a reason, of course. Brian says, hi Warren, when do you believe Cybertruck will be realistically available in the UK? Um, I have a Model 3, but considering a Model Y, if Cybertruck isn't coming until 2024. I think if you ordered a Cybertruck, and you're in the UK, and there's no regulatory hurdle to getting it, then you might be able to get your Cybertruck. I don't know. It's I, I, My gut hunch would be that there's effectively unlimited demand for Cybertruck in the US for the, for the amount that they're going to be able to make. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't ship some Cybertrucks to the UK or to Europe or even Asia if there was enough of a demand. Um, they might send a few of them over there just for the heck of it, but I don't, I don't think you're going to see Cybertruck in volume in Europe because Cybertruck isn't really made for European roads. What is my opinion on Jack Sweeney, Elon Jet guy, exposing not only Elon's personal jet, but also the planes of SpaceX? I'm not, I'm not happy about that. I think that um, it was cute early on, and now I think it's not a good idea. And look, the reality is that Elon is changing the world for the better, and there are people who don't like it, and it does create a security threat. And I wish the guy would stop. My Twitter friends found the tweet for Berlin mid-February. Here's the text. Uh, I'm headed to Berlin mid-February, not this week. 
I obviously can't comment on every rumor, but this isn't true. I'm headed to Berlin in February, not this week. <clears throat> um, well, I think you should be aware that Elon's schedule probably changes on a regular basis. Um, Mid-February, That I mean, it makes sense that he wants to go in and check on the status of Giga Berlin to see how close they are to producing vehicles in volume or what the holdups might be. I think that's just something he does a lot. Matt Trezar says HD mapping is only part of the equation. Uh, it's naive to think Google, one of the companies at the forefront of AI development, is not trying to apply AI principles to LiDAR technology. They're just not advertising the development efforts. Okay, so it's not just applying AI principles to LiDAR technology. You have to identify objects. You have to predict what those objects are going to do. Does LiDAR add value there? Not really. Andre Karpathy showed in a presentation probably a year or so ago that they're able to use cameras to generate point clouds. They're basically able to generate data equivalent to what would be generated by LiDAR. They call it pseudo LiDAR. So LiDAR doesn't add any value there. Um, but, you know, we humans identify objects and predict what they're going to do with our eyes and, and our brains only. So we don't use LiDAR. We don't use radar. So I think there's an open question there about what does LiDAR add to this effort? And I don't think it adds anything. There's absolutely, I agree with you though, there's absolutely much more going on than HD mapping, but I'm just saying, I wrote in a Waymo, it was very limited, it was very disappointing. Um, I, I And they haven't scaled. If, if Waymo had a solution, they've had eight years or so to develop it. If they had a solution, why haven't they built a lot more? And the answer is because when their approach doesn't scale, you need to have massive numbers of vehicles like Tesla has generating massive amounts of data so that you can train on that massive amount of data. And Tesla has it and they don't. So how do I think the first test subjects for Neuralink will be selected? Uh, quadriplegic or tetraplegic, uh, my guess would be somebody in the San Francisco area. Um, I think there was one particular Elon fan or Tesla fan who's tweeted about it. Um, I, I don't know that I can answer the question, how would they be selected? I think there's, <clears throat> there are protocols that neurosurgeons would follow in making those decisions that are probably uh, nitpicky details that are important in a medical world that, that I wouldn't necessarily understand and the rest of us wouldn't necessarily understand. You know, what, what's the person's cardiovascular condition? If they have a heart problem, maybe it's not good to do this on them. You find somebody who's in the best health other than their paraplegia or quadriplegia and, you know, identifying somebody who's in good mental health. I think there's a lot of different factors that, that have to be vetted before you decide whether this person's right for this procedure. Um, so I, and I, I, I don't know if, and Siobhan Zillis refers to it as first human. So I don't know that there's going to be more than one first test subject. There may be one first test subject just to see how it goes with that one first one. If that works, then they can go on and try others. They see promise with the first one. Will an early version of the Tesla bot be necessary to plug in the cars at superchargers for the robo taxi network? Will this bot possibly use the same charger so it can plug itself in and operate indefinitely? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think bot will be ready in time to be a solution for supercharging. Um, I think that it's probably unnecessary anyway. There's probably other ways of doing that that make more sense. Um, and look, having the early days of the robo taxi network, I expect that there will be humans working at the superchargers who will make sure that the cars are being charged properly and will also check to make sure the cars are clean. Um, eventually, is that a task that would be taken over by bot? Maybe, or maybe they're going to have a custom designed supercharger that's designed to plug in directly, you know, using like the snake charger. Um, I don't think it's that much to have the, the amount of effort it takes for a human to plug in and just to, to a plug or unplug a supercharger into a car is so low. And you're talking about five or 10 seconds. So at, you know, $10 an hour for that labor cost, the, the cost of having the human do that work is trivial. And having a human there to, like I said, look in the cars, make sure the cars are clean. I think there's a lot of value added there that a human actually adds value. And ultimately, will a bot be trainable for that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, they had a prototype snake charger years ago. Exactly. All right. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that leapt out at me this week. 
I don't, I'm not seeing anything. I am just, I'll just talk a little bit about what I'm working on. Um, Lucid Motors. Oh, did I mention? I did mention Lucid. So I wanted to mention that Lucid Motors. Sarah says, haven't been able to watch the past two weeks. What's the update with your girlfriend? Any new developments? So my girlfriend moved in. Uh, she was still cleaning out her place. I have a video on my channel that um, we're trying to sell her condo in South Miami. It's called uh, Cutler Bay, Miami. Cutler Bay in Miami-Dade County. Yeah, let's go, Brandon. Okay. So thank you, Victor. Um, I'll just say politically. Let me just say this politically because that uh, I do. I do. Smile. We, we we've had a very nice morning chatting with each other. Uh, we get along very well. Uh, we're both a little sick, but we're both doing okay. Um, so the update is she moved in, and we're getting along, and we're moving forward. And it's uh, you know, it's, it's a lo it's a long road. We have some great ideas about what we're doing in the future. What am I most excited about this year? Well, I'm excited about my girlfriend, obviously, but um, I am excited about Starship. Starship, Starship. I'm excited about Neuralink. I'm excited about Boring Company. Uh, I don't think, oh, I didn't include the clip. Uh, Boring Company um, reached Resort World. So the, the beginnings of the Las Vegas loop are now happening. That um, the Boring Company tunnel system has reached Resorts World. So they will soon be able to take traffic from Resorts World to the Las Vegas Convention Center. They're using proof rock. They're going to be expanding um, drilling or boring of the tunnels in Las Vegas to be to create this big system. I'm really excited about that. Boring Fort Lauderdale, boring Miami. There's a lot, a lot of potential to do a lot of great things with Boring Company. Elon mentioned Boring Company in the Q4 investor calls. I'm seeing a lot of great things there. Update on the pod car. The pod car has been on hold. I have been distracted by my personal life and distracted by uh, COVID and other things. I do have. Yeah, this is a this is the paperwork for my lawyer that I got to fill out to uh, get started on forming the corporation for the pod car. I've just been stalling on that, and I don't have a good excuse for it. I have so much on my plate, and uh, and definitely the um, life's distractions are holding me back from doing things I want to do. So, what am I excited about? I'm excited about Boring Company. I'm excited about Neuralink. I want I want to hear about Neuralink going into human trials. I want to see a human who was paralyzed, uh, basically fully paralyzed, being able to op operate a mouse and a keyboard on a computer screen and and take that to the next level. Um, girlfriend is not going to be hired as my assistant. Girlfriend has her own job. Girlfriend is a her name's Kara. Kara is a mental health counselor and she counsels people in. Kind of like Zoom calls. Um, we call it tele telehealth, uh, mental health consults. And I'm, I'm working with her on helping her develop her website and helping her develop her business so she can shift from a platform where she makes half as much money as she should to a platform where she'll make more money than, you know, what she should make. And that will free her up financially and make her life better. So... <clears throat> And um, did I ever hear from Jack and Jack and Jesse about my reaction video? No, they did not respond. Oh, the surgery. Thank you, Dave to Dave. So I was supposed to have surgery. I developed a fever the night before the surgery, canceled the surgery, tested positive for COVID the next morning. Um, so I, I was told to wait. It was seven, 10 days and then get tested. If I test negative, then I can go ahead and reschedule the surgery. So um, I don't know. The surgeon thought I the surgery's off. Surgeon's office thought I would be able to potentially get scheduled again in ten days. Oh, I have a called an inguinal hernia. I like to joke and say it's it's because I started having sex. Um, but my urologist said no, that is not what caused it. So it's a, it's an inguinal hernia surgery, which is a very common thing, and um, the the surgeon that I talked to about having the surgery done said what's most likely the case is that the hernia was already there and I, I was working out at, at the gym every day for more than a month and the surgeon said it was probably you know lifting weights exacerbated the pre-existing hernia so I'd like to say that it's just the, the power of my sexual energy that caused the hernia but no it was probably lifting weights uh, exacerbating a pre-existing problem so that surgery will make it that was that's going to take a lot out of me too so unfortunately things are getting held up a little bit here and there i also need to have a, a procedure on my throat and my esophagus called the shatsky ring dilation 
That's probably going to be after the hernia surgery because I just think the hernia surgery needs to get done. So hopefully in a few days I will get, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but in a few days, maybe the nasal swab will be negative and I'll be able to reschedule the surgery and the scourgery will be in a few weeks, two weeks or something like that, two weeks. And we'll get that done. And, uh, and I'll be able to use my full sexual energy and also go back to the gym. But I'm going to be out of commission, like not for making videos. I may be more productive because of that. Um, I am not going to Starbase anytime soon. Uh, so I wish Ellie luck with her trip to Starbase. I think she did tell me she was going. Um, which person did you not meet? Oh, um, I have not met Elon. The, the, there was a tweet that I put up on Twitter listing the, the five, five people, five celebrities that I either met or got close to, and, you know, one of them being a lie. And I was at the Plaid event, and I got reasonably close to Elon, but not within a few feet. And um, he's, he's replied to me eight times on Twitter, but um, I, I, I saw Jay Leno at the Hermosa Beach Comedy and Magic Club, sat in the front row, and he talked to me. He asked me questions, like, in, as part of the act. So... That was Jay Leno. I met Patrick Ewing very briefly in an airport. I also met Lawrence Taylor very briefly in an airport, but I didn't put him on my list. Um, I met John Stossel at a drug policy reform event. Uh, oh, I meant to put Rudy Giuliani in there. I actually had a photo taken with Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> so I had my fair share of encounters with famous people. Ellie and you in the gym video was hilarious. Maybe you got there and you then. <laughs> no, that was not it. There was supposed to be a second gym video, but we didn't... The response to the first gym video was kind of weak, so we didn't bother doing a second one. All right, so we're approaching an hour, and I am tired, and I'm out of material, so I am going to stop this video, and thank. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for watching. I, thank, I want to thank the local supporters in particular, Patreon supporters, YouTube exclusive content channel members, and everybody else for supporting. Um... I'm going to run, I'm going to, I'm recording this. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to run it on YouTube and we'll see how it goes. Thanks everybody for watching.